Can you believe the Highlander series even survived Highlander 2? The first movie was so good, we continued to watch shitty Highlander movie after shitty Highlander movie, even though it was clear early on there was no future in this. And with every sequel and with every retcon, the series was just gonna keep hurting us. The clouds. Highlander fans are like those hillbilly domestic abuse victims you always see on cops who never press charges despite their husbands repeatedly punching them in the eyes, always screaming, I can't leave him, I love him. The Highlander series is the cinematic equivalent of herpes and its fans, the kind of people who enjoy picking at scabs. Not a good combination. But at least this was the worst of it, you know? We took comfort in knowing that no matter what, this is as bad as it would ever get. It was all uphill from here. But no. I'm just gonna throw this out there, and you're not gonna believe me. Because it's not possible. I still can't really believe it, but I'm gonna say anyway. Highlander the Source is a worse fucking movie than Highlander 2 The Quickening. And that, that is not a statement one can make lightly, because this is the archetypical bad fucking movie, and it's not even the worst movie in the series. You'd think if there were worse movies in the world floating around, you'd have fucking heard about them by now. But there's a very good reason why you haven't. You never saw it. Hell, you probably weren't even aware it existed until I just now told you. I wasn't aware until I saw it in the bargain bin at a Walmart about a year ago. This movie was never screened in theaters. Hell, it wasn't even direct-to-video. It was a direct-to-sci-fi channel original movie. The same company that makes movies of the same prestige and caliber as Mansquito. Then, as if you weren't already ashamed enough to waste your weekends watching shit like Frankenfish, they started to wonder aloud, could we possibly make it so that every single thing about this channel is ridiculous and embarrassing, right down to the name there? Honestly, it really is that extra little bit. It's not enough that I'm about to watch Knights of Bloodsteel, but add in the fact I'm watching it on the Siffy channel, that really makes me yearn to wrap my lips around a fucking Glock. Uh, so where was I? Oh yeah, Highlander the Farce. Nobody saw this shit. Hell, when I bought it, I didn't watch it. It sat on my shelf for over a year, and I'm one of the biggest fans of the original movie you will ever find. And the only reason I did end up eventually watching it is because I was doing research to review this movie. And I almost stopped that review before scripting because Highlander the Source pissed me off even more than The Quickening. Oh yes! This movie did more damage to the franchise than Zeist! And I can tell you still don't believe me, so get ready to have Highlander ruined for you all over again, just like the first time, because it's time to go back to the source. Immortal. No, fuck you! I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just get a little emotionally invested in the series, and I just want it to stop sucking! They can only be killed with the loss of their head. They gain more power by killing other immortals. They cannot have children. They're aliens from the planet Zeist, but nobody likes to talk about it. The series hasn't been relevant since Sean Connery jumped ship like the first white bitch off the Titanic. Speaking of, quite a step down from Sean Connery's iconic intro. See, already I got a big problem with this movie. The presence of this card baffles me. It's literally a list, lacking any poetry or creative flair, basically spelling out like Cliff's notes of Highlander for fucking idiots. Is this necessary? If I'm watching a direct-to-video Highlander flick, I'm pretty much a die-hard fan and know this shit already. Nobody's gonna use this movie as a jumping on point. And what about no fighting on holy ground? Did we just forget about that as one of the defining traits of immortals? Wouldn't you argue that's far more relevant to the proceedings than no children? No one knows who they were. Oh, oh shit, I'm sorry, I already made that joke. The world has fallen into chaos and decay. Yeah, okay, Galadriel, thanks. Oh man, another dystopian future? It's even opening like Highlander 2. Jeez, this apocalypse looks like it was a bad one too. Look, he can't even go 10 yards without running into a flaming barrel. He is on a quest to find the source. A holy grail of peace and salvation to some immortals. And even though it's a legend well known to all immortals that rules their very destinies, we didn't really think it was worth mentioning till about six movies in. Many believe it does not exist at all. Like Duncan McLeod, an immortal who thinks the source is a fairy tale. Duncan is also the only man I've ever loved. 
And you are? My first thought goes to Faith, the other love of Duncan's life that was suddenly and inexplicably railroaded into the plot of the last movie, Highlander Endgame, but that would make too much goddamn sense when we could just radically rewrite and backbill Duncan's entire backstory for no reason, again! We haven't spoken in months, but sometimes I sense his presence, watching me, protecting me. See? He's always watching me in these hilariously bad composite shots, squatting on a rooftop like he's fucking Batman or some shit. Why is he up here? Doesn't he have something better to do? Well, apparently Duncan's taken up fighting crime on the mean streets of Slovakia when he notices, by chance, two thugs about to rape a screaming woman in an alley. Let the woman go, you are under arrest. I think the purpose of that scene was to establish that Duncan is a badass, and I was able to figure that out because, thinking back, this scene was also used to staggering effectiveness in, um, oh, what movie was it? Oh yeah, every single fucking superhero movie ever made! You know what might have been a better way to establish Duncan's fighting prowess with a sword? Put him in a fucking sword fight! Oh, but I'm sorry, we can't do that. See, Duncan's in his endless brooding phase and he's renounced his sword again for probably the tenth time now. Probably over that girl who keeps talking that we've never met before. The opening sword fight really comes when this guy, who we also don't know and have never met before, breaks into this place we also don't know. One thing I do know is they really need to fire the janitorial staff. He breaks into the building with all the style I usually demonstrate whenever I try to play Hitman and get detected almost immediately. Hey, whoa, whoa! Jesus Christ, man, he's fucking serious about guarding that elevator, dude! Holy shit, he's about to cast a spell on me! Wounded from the gunfire, he collapses into the elevator, which apparently sensed what floor he wanted to go to since he never fucking pushed a button. And when he emerges, his wounds are already healed because, you know, he's immortal. Aha! There! That will in no way hinder the guard's ability to call the elevator from the ground floor and will in fact only hinder my own escape! This done, he approaches some computer in this conference room and finds it locked. They can be only one. Login confirmed. No. <laughs> you didn't. That didn't just happen. They can be only one. Where the fuck is he? Please tell me! I didn't leave anything out! He approaches some nameless building we've never seen before, collapses in an elevator, emerges on some random floor into a conference room he had no idea would be there, approaches the computer that presumably runs the fucking AV projector or some shit, which happens to be voice locked, because, you know, it's the future, a simple alphanumeric password would just be fucking impossible to crack, but why is it locked with the Highlander catchphrase? Who owns this building and programmed the computers this way? This is never explained! And further, why does the voice print recognize the words, but not reject the unfamiliar voice of the unauthorized person in the building? You know, like voice recognition software can do in present day? I don't know. Maybe the password was so he could call Mythos and Filmbrain and join their video conference. But if so, why did he need to come to this fucking building? Over the past week, the planets of our solar system have moved outside their orbital paths and are coming into alignment. I mean, do you know how unusual that is? Um, <laughs> impossible would be the word I choose to describe it. Unusual is the Dallas Cowboys winning or finding a watchable episode of Star Trek Voyager. Unusual is not whole planets radically shifting their orbital paths. For instance, a woman wandering outside at night and witnessing several planets in this celestial alignment, which are all bigger than the moon by now? That is impossible! But that could just be a little wobble. But that could just be a little wobble. Orbital wobble is one thing, but this... This is outside the laws of celestial mechanics. Orbital wobble? Really? Really? You're just gonna throw a term like that out there, like he knows what the fuck he's talking about. Do you even know what orbital wobble is? I do! Shut up! I googled it, bitch! It's an optical illusion wherein the elliptical paths of planets in the system where the center of mass is... You know what? Fuck it. This isn't it! And you'd think a motherfucker who is over 6,000 years old might have picked up a book on this at some point and would know better than to say something this fucking stupid! You can't go 10 seconds without finding some brand new way of horrifying me to my fucking core. There's so much stupid shit going on so quickly in this fucking movie, I can't even stop to explain how stupid the stupid shit is without four other different monuments to insanity being built simultaneously. 
You can't possibly keep this up. We're only eight minutes into this movie, and you cannot possibly top Orbital Wobble. I... Zai, where is the location of the source? Tell us what you found. Excuse me. Well, this is it. You might as well just stop the movie here because I swear to you, this is the only thing you'll remember about it to the day you die. This guy with this hair is the tombstone in the Highlander franchise. I mean, Highlander 2 had these guys, and Highlander Endgame had this guy, and somehow, without even saying a word, this guy with a single hairdo manages to once and for all destroy the slightest shred of coherency and dignity this series ever held. This is it. It's over. I mean, are you kidding me with this guy? Who the fuck is he? He's supposed to be some kind of Catholic priest or what, a cardinal? In what fucking bullcock and maybe reality does this pasty, swishy, Jersey Shore motherfucker with this hair attain any level of authority in the Catholic Church? Dude looks like Billy Idol somehow had a child with Ziggy fucking Stardust. There's so much hair gel in this mohawk, it looks like he gets hair tips from fucking Waka. Is all this necessary? Do you believe for a second this guy is having a conversation with a holographic video conferencing rig set up in the middle of the main worship area of a fucking cathedral? Okay, when you're doing worse composite shots than me, stop making movies! Okay, now, again, you're not gonna believe this, but this movie has not yet begun to suck! Where is the location of the source? I've written the coordinates down on this map. The coordinates are... The coordinates... Or on... Oh, God damn it! I knew I shouldn't have written the location of the source on a Carl's Jr. wrapper. Okay, now, with all this confusion with the hair and the celestial alignment crap, I lost track of the entire purpose of this scene. Why, oh why, did this guy break into this building? It's a simple question. Why the fuck is he here? Why did he come here? To hack the computer? Well, he doesn't actually access any data from the computer. He already has the information on the map. He just uses the computer to call Mythos and tell him about the source. Dude, it's called a cell phone. Or, failing that, go to a Starbucks and send a fucking email. And don't even fucking tell me those didn't survive the apocalypse. It's 2010, and my toilet's wired to the internet to rate my fucking turds on Twitter. And even if there's been a complete and total personal telecommunications meltdown, and clearly there hasn't been if the fucking Vatican is wired for connect video chat, but even if there has been, just walk in, smile, and ask the goddamn security guard if he can use his phone! Anyway, this whole time Zai's been followed by a uh, Nine Inch Nails video. I mean, Voldo from Soul Calibur. Uh, no, I mean, uh, Inverse Pyramid Head? No, this is the villain, known only as the Guardian of the Source, or as I like to call him, Evil Bondage Pelican Head Man. And why does he wear such a ridiculous thing? Well, because it's a huge piece of armor that can easily deflect decapitation attempts. Which actually, I have to admit, when you're an immortal who can only die when his head is cut off, is pretty damn ingenious. I mean, you do it. I'd wear a kicky Doctor Who scarf made of Kevlar, but point is, the whole neck armor thing is pretty clever. So, naturally, after he kills Zai by unfairly using the armor to his advantage, he removes it and never puts it on again for the rest of the movie, because, you know, now that we've firmly established the armor for the audience, there's no reason to keep it around. Now, of course, at this point in the movie, your common, uneducated moviegoer is bound to ask himself several questions like, uh, why? Uh, what the fuck was the point of that? Was the screenwriter a fucking four-year-old? Uh, what goose shit was that waste of time about? Well... It's actually a well-known foreshadowing technique in literature, known as Chekhov's gun. I believe it goes something like, uh, if you say in the first chapter there's a rifle hanging on the wall, you should use it immediately to kill a pointless peripheral side character the audience barely knows or cares about, and then throw it out the window, never to mention it again in the second or third chapters. <laughs> Did the Guardian just make a little down with the sickness sound? He puts Zai through the table, which breaks with a remarkably even pattern down the middle. It's almost like it was pre-cut that way. Be only me. Zai! 
For those of you who have never seen a Highlander movie before, this is The Quickening! Oh crap, 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 I didn't think this through! Duncan investigates the destroyed tower, as it was kind of hard for anyone to miss that particular quickening. Um, okay, I was not expecting that from him. What are you? I'm the Guardian. Duncan McCloud! You have squandered your precious gift! Ouch, um, maybe you shouldn't point out this guy actually has a better Scottish accent than Adrian Paul. You could have ruled the world! And you pissed it away. Have a nice day. The female Anna! What's Anna got to do with this? And who the fuck is Anna? What's Anna got to do with this? Every day. Wow, you're really gonna stick with this performance, are ya? This is like what you'd get if you cast Jim Carrey as the Kurgan. Okay, now where did he get that? He just pulled that sword right out of his ass! Already, you're probably noticing that this movie is nothing like any of the previous Highlander films. The fight choreography looks like they just captured video from Mortal Kombat 2. I was about to say it looks cartoony, but even the cartoon showed more restraint than this. I almost wish this had anime speed lines as backgrounds. Hell, it very nearly does in this scene. There's no dramatic tension or weight here. No character or emotion in these battles. No suspense or any opportunity for these actors to give a performance. We're just watching animators masturbate all over Highlander's face. It's a fucking disgrace. Duncan turns out to be no match for the Guardian's super speed, because that's all they could come up with to make him a credible threat to Duncan at this point, turning him into the Flash, until Duncan's buddy Joe Dawson roars to the rescue, because Joe just happens to be in the same rat's-ass corner of Eastern Europe as Duncan, and owns an American model truck there. You know, if they were trying to use this movie as a pilot episode for a Highlander sitcom, I'd tune in. Hello, Joe! Get in the car. Get out of here, Joe. I don't have time for this bullshit. Get in the car! What are you doing? <laughs> so much for watchers not interfering, huh? You're a watcher. You can't interfere. I just said fuck it. You took an oath. There is no Watcher organization anymore. Oh, there's no Watchers anymore, right. That must have taken place sometime in that whole apocalypse thing. Maybe we ought to explain that at some point. It only radically changed every fundamental aspect of the setting we were familiar with and completely altered every character's personality and relationships with one another. I'm sure they'll get right on that. Okay, so bottom line. Now everyone's looking for the source, that all-important immortal thingy. We're only bringing up six movies into the series. It's such bullshit. Mythos and others don't think it's bullshit. Shit. They're looking for the source. Oh. They all start heading to a monastery called the Brotherhood of Pain. Yeah, these must be the guys who made this movie, including this lady who was summoned by God? Seek the source. This is CNN. If you hadn't guessed, this is Anna, the special guest love of Duncan's life. Can't Mrs. McLeod be nervous? Wait, so they got married? What about Faith from Endgame? Did she die? I don't think so, because at the end of that movie, what, what kind of man whore is Duncan anyway? What is it with these movies repeatedly blindsiding us with the great true romances of Duncan's life he's never ever mentioned or even thought about until now? Eventually, Anna leaves him because she wants a child. You know, these tragic romances might have some emotional resonance if you fucking establish them before making them the focal point of the entire plot! You only had, oh, I don't know, a six-year television run to do that? Oh yeah, what about Amanda? That's an idea. A doy! Okay, so eventually they all get to this monastery, which, judging from the landscape, is in Mordor. I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and say I don't believe this place really exists. But apparently you can take a cab straight to it. And what incredible luck, they all left from different areas all over the world and arrived here by car within seconds of one another. This is different. 
why does Mythos need a helmet? I don't know. So anyway, they go and see the elder of the monastery who's... Okay, now seriously, this movie is just fucking with me at this point. <sighs> Film Brain goes outside to stand guard with Joe, when suddenly he experiences that funny prickling sensation immortals get when they sense another immortal approaching. Funny how nobody felt that earlier in front of the monastery when Mythos arrived. Instead of alerting the others, he walks out there alone to confront the Guardian. This seems unwise. Man, that's one fast bird. You stay here. I can take care of this. Um, yeah, no, you can't. You're gonna die. A lot. There are worse things than death. Apparently. Oh, oh! I don't want to be this close to his giant wrinkled ball sack! For God's sakes, man, close your robe! Gah! Meanwhile, Jabba the Hutt is telling them the story of how he led a group of immortals long ago to find the source. On Mars? Where the fuck are they? My friend fought valiantly, but I wanted my immortality. Something went terribly wrong. It left us both cursed. Me like this. And he doomed to take his place as the god. So what you're telling me is that the source has a sense of humor. The Guardian gets super speed and turn the Elder into a 900 pound talking testicle. Like graveyards! I love them. I mean, who wants to live forever? Who wants to live forever? What the fuck is with this guy? I mean, he's supposed to be the ancient, unkillable Guardian of the Source. The ultimate evil, the greatest threat the immortals in the world have ever faced. And he's some mugging chucklehead who croons Queen Show tunes. I mean, I'm sorry, every time something stupid happens in this movie, all I can do is cut back here and do this. But it's like the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life every 20 goddamn seconds. What else is there to say about this shit but what the fuck? This is blasphemy! It is true! This is Sparta! As you get closer to the source, you will grow weaker and lose your immortality! Uh, why? Shouldn't they get stronger as they approach the source of immortality? How much more could they possibly alienate Highlander fans at this point? We've only changed the setting, the characters, and now we've changed the entire premise of the movie since the immortals aren't immortal anymore. Why are they looking for the source anyway? If approaching it makes them vulnerable, shouldn't they want to run away from the source as fast and as far as possible? Meanwhile, Reggie's <clears throat> got the Guardian well in hand. No need to call for help. There can be only one. Maybe, but they weren't talking about you. Check it out. Joe just racked a perfectly good unfired shell out of his shotgun. He might have been able to use it, too. Duncan arrives just in time to save him and hurls his katana into the guy's throat, which he just breaks off and rams into Joe. I killed you, little one, audience. Good night. I could easily kill you now because you're completely unarmed, but that's it for me. I'm out of here. And, well, there you have it. The Guardian breaks Duncan McCloud's signature katana weapon. There is now officially nothing left of the iconic Highlander series. It's dead. Duncan goes through the rest of the movie swinging 10-inch knives he finds on the ground somewhere. And Joe, one of the most endearing and proactive characters of the series, he's dead too. Killed by a guy who completely disregards the rule against fighting on holy ground, with no repercussions whatsoever. I thought you were thought to do something. So Mythos squats down, doesn't even inspect the wound, and just kind of walks away. God, that takes a pant load, bro. Anyway, the Elder tells Anna she has the gift of prophecy and can sense where the source is somewhere on an island. But this subplot is rendered entirely pointless when Film Brain figures it out on his own using his laptop. It's, it's just great when the movie somehow manages to render its own character superfluous. So they get on a boat. Very fortunate, I think, to find a friendly sea captain willing to give five armed weirdos with no money a lift. We need to dock. Impossible. 
They are maniacs on that island. Cannibals. They must have seized the port. So in the intervening time between the end of the TV series and now, the world has come under real threat by roving armies of cannibals? Do you ever get the feeling we just missed a way more interesting movie just before this one? So, in another scene I bet you'd never thought you'd see, the heroes do battle with a pack of cannibals. iconic about Highlander, everything the fans know and love about the series, and then set out to make a movie systematically destroying and making a mockery out of all of it? Not only were they content to destroy Highlander, but they had to kill Queen too? Freddie Mercury is spinning in his fucking grave right now! Highlander 2 never reached this level of abject fuckness! Oh my god, those fucking knives. Those pussy things don't even look like swords. They look like he's about to serve you pie. The heroes hole up somewhere for the night and lay down an impenetrable security net. There's no way the Guardian could possibly find a weak link here. Oh, shit. You know, maybe putting the worst swordsman in the group alone, outside, and drinking whiskey when you're being menaced by an ancient mythical Guardian who has demonstrated super strength and speed on every occasion you've seen him wasn't the best idea. <laughs> <laughs> Fatality. Why didn't he take his head? Why didn't we know he was here? They decide to hit the road to get away from the Guardian, but to their surprise, Reggie dies from his wounds instead of regenerating, because remember, they're losing their immortality. It's happening. He didn't heal because his faith wasn't pure. Oh shit, for fuck's sake, is it even worth pointing out in how many ways that statement is stupid? How many evil immortals have roamed the Earth in this series? How many non-Catholic immortals who he's well aware of? Hell, he's rolling with Mythos, who is literally one of the four horsemen of the fucking apocalypse. Dude's a walking holocaust. This character is so cliche and one-dimensional, it reads like something a 14-year-old would write as fan fiction. Then he senses the Guardian approaching, and this moments after Mythos comments that they couldn't. So can they fucking sense him or not? One thing's for sure. If we can be killed... So can the Guardian. Well, that's an interesting theory, except we've seen several times now the Guardian still possesses all his speed from before, so, uh, yeah, Duncan's an idiot. And you know, I think I just figured out why they wrote in this script they all lost their immortality, because they couldn't afford the pyrotechnics and effects for any more quickenings on this piece of shit. Because there are no more. Ironically, they've all got bigger problems than the Guardian right now, because the woods are chock full of more cannibals, and they get captured again. And for some reason, the cannibals still have all their horses, which you'd think would be the first to go in a hunger crisis, but whatever. Take them! For me! Ooh, dang, you know, I just had an idea. If they were still immortal, they could cut pieces off and they'd grow right back and they'd have an endless supply of meat. Mythos burgers for everyone! This can't be the end. God wouldn't let this happen to a true Christie. <laughs> yeah, okay, buddy, but uh, show me again in the Bible where it says, Thou shalt bleach the everlasting shit out of thy hair and shape it into an extraordinarily gay mohawk. Oh, crap, it's the Wicker Man! Not the bees! Ah! The Guardian shows up and, like a classic Bond villain, kidnaps Anna and leaves the others to their fate instead of just killing them. Monsignor Mohawk had a knife hidden away in his crucifix, though. A special order from the Vatican Frockery catalog. He has chosen me. There can be only one. Did Mythos just not sense this minor gibbering insanity character flaw in this guy before he decided to form his little source hunter group? 
Naturally, he gets caught by the cannibals, who notice his giggling ass is missing almost immediately. This leaves Duncan in something of a predicament, and by predicament, I mean the easiest decision he's ever made in his life. Leave him. Can't. Um, yeah, you fucking can. You really can. Please leave him. So, Duncan springs to the rescue, and Giovanni flees like a frightened chipmunk. Hadoosh! Well, I'm sure, much like Gollum in Lord of the Rings, Duncan's kind-heartedness will pay off in the- oh, there you have it. Mitha suddenly just decides to leave, because I guess the screenwriter couldn't think of anything else for him to do, I guess. I wanted it to be me, but... You are the best of us. Would he just run out of line so he's going home? Hey, here's an idea. Why don't you help Duncan fight the unbeatable fucking Guardian? Well, whatever the source is, I guess it's good it carved out those convenient steps for everyone. Oh, and by now, Jupiter and Saturn are closer than the moon! You know, it's a good thing that a secret alliance of immortals, a computer genius, a prophet, and an ancient secret order of monks were around, or the astrologers of Earth would never have been able to piece together this subtle series of clues to find the secret location of the source. Do you have any idea the global cataclysm that would occur if this many planets were this close to Earth? You'd have hurricanes, catastrophic tsunamis, devastating tidal changes, not to mention a complete change in the solar system's center of mass, followed by apocalyptic shifts in the Earth's orbit. Rivers and seas boiling. Forty years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes. Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Enough, I get the point. All right, wait, when did Duncan get super speed? Could he always do that? I'm so confused. Oh god, I've seen better special effects on my PS3 dashboard. This is like some horrible deleted scene from Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. How did we get here, guys? Really? Because I have no explanation for this. This really shouldn't be complicated. I mean, the story is not all that complex. You want to make a sequel to Highlander, watch Highlander, and then make something just like it! So now I'm just going to show you how the fight ends, and uh, I promise you ahead of time, I didn't edit this, I didn't add any special effects, I did nothing to this footage. People were actually paid to create this. This aired on national television. This was sold in stores. Just... Let's watch that again. Duncan spins around the guy so fast, he actually drills himself into the ground until he's buried up to his shoulders. I'm almost convinced they stole the entire fight choreography from a battle between Bugs Bunny and Daffy fucking Duck. Do it. I am Duncan McLeod of the Clam McLeod. Who I am is who I was. Do it, you immortal fuck. No. But being a good guy, Duncan refuses to kill a helpless opponent, so the guy explodes. I really don't get any of this. There are some who do not believe the source exists, but those who do believe have no idea what the source truly is. <laughs> Neither do I, and I saw the fucking movie! The most powerful force in the universe, but it cannot be used for evil. Only one immortal can reach the source and pass its test. Only Duncan McLeod was able to pass the test of the Source. I'm done with this. Because the test is not about strength. It's about purity of heart. Fuck. You. Movie. The Immortals believed that there could be only one. That all had to die for that one to remain. But it wasn't about death. It was about life you and die! Duncan was the one to have a child. A gift from the source to us and the world. No! No! Not this way! 
You're telling me that this whole time, everything we've ever been told about fucking immortals, their fundamental reason for existing since the first fucking movie, the foundation for the entire series, fighting until only one remains, was always complete bullshit? There could be only one, the source. It's all been a lie. Yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it was just a story we made up to make ourselves feel better at night. It's all just completely invalidated because it's all about being pure of heart. What bullshit. The prize was never in danger of being captured by evil. It couldn't be captured by evil. All that fighting, all that struggle, every person that suffered and died, it was all for no reason? In the end, there can be only one. Oh no, no, I'm sorry, Ramirez. There can only be lots, but if you're a really, really nice guy, you win the prize. Turns out everything you told Connor McCloud was wrong! There can be only one. Fuck you! Fuck you and your Care Bears, mealy mouth, pure hearted dick shit. You mean to tell me you've been crushing my balls since 1991 to tell me that the only thing Connor McCloud needed to do to win the prize was give the Kurgan a big fucking hug? Fuck you! And what about the animated series? How will that purity of heart crap pan out for the Jeditor? Oh, that's right, they all fucking died! What about Darius, the guy from the TV show who completely renounced violence and became a Franciscan monk and served as Duncan's moral compass? Oh, what, was Darius not fucking pure of heart enough? This is how Highlander ends. Not with a literal bang, but with that same atrocious, brutal, offensive, horrible, shitheel band torturing who wants to live forever as a final twist of the knife in the audience's heart. This is how the series rewards our loyalty? This is a spit in the face of the entire fan base and a systematic raping of the series' core principles. This series stopped being recognizable as Highlander a long time ago. I admit that, but with this, it becomes the complete antithesis of the original movie that the fans knew and loved. It's not like the creators didn't just not get Highlander. Oh, they got it, but they have a burning, seething contempt for it and all its fans. All the fans who came back to this series time and again, enduring the quickening, suffering through Endgame, watched that wretched fucking cartoon and played that horrible fucking video game, and who even gave the fucking Raven spinoff a chance, and it was all a waste of time. And the prize is just the ability to have a fucking child? The intro of this movie asks if the source exists to bring salvation or death, when in reality, it does neither. It only exists so Duncan can pork some vacant-eyed bimbo when she can fart out a baby. Fuck a doodle doo. Oh, that makes it all worth it. This movie did more damage to my childhood memories than The Phantom Fucking Menace. It's not only the worst movie of the series, it's damn near one of the worst, most offensive, piss-poor movies ever made, and they can kiss my ass! <laughs> Fuck you two! Highlander 2 The Quickening? How about a good Highlander 2 Dick Kickening? <laughs> and you! Oh, don't even think I forgot about you, motherfucker! There can be only one! Ah! <laughs> ah!
What are you? I'm the Guardian. 